Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the 16 Bitchin' Podcast. And of course, it is another special one. We get to interview another YouTuber. Now, this YouTuber is very special, but we will get to that shit in a minute. He is the one and only Stuart from Generation Pixel. Hello, Tom, and thank you for bringing me on. And I'm, I'm going to fanboy a bit because I love your channel so much. You okay. lying bastard. How could you say I, uh, that to me? I absolutely adore Sega Head. I, I know probably it's more of a character with you than real life, but what uh. you do on your channel's fan. Well, I, I'm assuming that there's a little bit of Tom in there. But no, I'm probably a lot of bit. I don't act very much. <laughs> But yeah, no, I'm absolutely delighted to be on this 16 bitching podcast. I've been watching it since your first episode and I'm astounded that you've asked me on. So thank you very much for bringing me on. Why are you astounded? Well, I mean, you've got so many great channels out there that are probably queuing up to speak to you. So I have that's... been shocked at the amount of people that say, yes, I'll go on. Like, really? Well, fuck. Best prep myself. Well, it's a really, do. it's a really good podcast. It's really well structured. It's always funny because you're always funny, and of course, people are going to want to come on. Oh, right, that's enough sweet. smoke getting blown up your ass, so we can get <laughs> on with what you want to talk about now. Well, first of all, we shall cover you, Stuart. So obviously, you're you're Scottish. Are you from Scotland? But are you actually Scottish then? I am Scottish, one hundred. But well, I'm not one hundred percent Scottish because my dad's a Geordie. So, <laughs> well, they're see, basically Scotsmen with their heads kicked in. We so love, uh, I'm making, mostly Scottish. <laughs> we love making fun of Jamie from Button Bashers because he's a Geordie. We all, well, uh, Tom and Lacey, when they first started talking to him, didn't know where he was from. Of course, they said your accent. Are you Scottish, Jamie? He's gone. No, I fucking <laughs> well am not. So since then, we keep calling him Scottish just to piss him off. <laughs> so Which is fair enough because you're one hundred percent Scottish in their eyes. So there. Yes, I'm one hundred percent Scottish. I was born and raised in the west coast of Scotland. So I've never been there. The closest I've been is uh, Ireland. So I went the wrong way. You just went too far. Yeah. Well, that sounds like me. Did you want? Did you want to go somewhere more rainy? I mean, I, was that I it? wanted was... to get away from the wife. Fair enough. I know. I made a mistake. <laughs> I came back. I'm sure we all do, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you realise yeah. you haven't packed any lunch. Anyway, I could go on <laughs> taking the piss out of her all fucking day, and I probably will somewhere. So let's get into you a bit. Generation Pixel. First off, why did you call your YouTube channel that? Generation Pixel, it's, it's a fairly easy story to, to go over. When I started the channel, now my channel is brand spanking new. I mean, I've been on, what, 18 months now. So, and before that, I hadn't even watched YouTube much. I didn't start watching YouTube until the, the very tail end of 2019. I had no idea what YouTube is really about. I mean, I thought YouTube was somewhere where you posted your family videos or uploaded like you've been frame clips. I mean, that's all YouTube was to me. I had no idea there was such a huge community out there, not just obviously with gamers, but with any community that you were looking for, there was a community for it. And back at the end of 2019, I started to think about collecting video games again because this is something that I've done on and off over the decades, and it has been decades. And somebody said, why don't you check out YouTube? And I goes, for video games? And they go, yeah. So checked out YouTube, hit all the big channels first, just by searching, you know, PlayStation 2 games to buy now, and the big channels all come up, and it's fantastic. Can you get sucked into that wormhole? Now, I started talking to my son about YouTube because I didn't realise that he knew about YouTube because if I didn't know, why would he know? And I said, have you seen YouTube? You can see games. And he said, Dad, I've been on YouTube for like five years and he had been since about the age of eight. He had been uploading videos of him sitting in his bedroom playing games. And I goes, well, this is great. This is something that we can do together. And as we know, COVID came along 2020 and everybody's stuck in 
the house and I said to him, do you want to start a channel with me? And he said, great, fantastic idea, I'll do that. And I can talk about older games and you can talk about the newer games. And all the kids were, they were big on calling people boomers at the time as well. Hmm. well I'm Gen X. I was born in the 70s, so I'm Gen X and boomers. And I thought, you know what we all are? We're all generation pixel because we all love video games. And that's where the title came for the channel because it was supposed to be me and the son doing it. Two different generations talking about video games. So that's a simple answer to that one. Well, I love the name. I think it's really imaginative. I see a lot of people out there with the word game in their YouTube name or retro in their YouTube name. And yeah, I will say this. I know I'm part of a group called Retro Refresh, but when we all decided to group together and names were being thrown out there, everyone was like, "Who? what do you think of Retro Refresh? Hands up if you like that. I did not put my fucking hand up. I didn't like the name, but I lost. No. So well. I don't like the name Retro and anything I think it's done to death so it's nice to see generation pixel it seems imaginative yet it's at the same time not it's very simple but it's very good i like the name so how would you describe the channel then well as i said the channel is really new i mean 18 months a year and a half so you've had you've had time a year and a half it was the end yeah it was a year and a half ago it was september 2020 when i uploaded my first video so I'm still trying to find my own voice on the format. Mm. So it's really, I mean, I do what everybody else does. If I get any pickups that I want to show, I show the pickups. If a top 10 list comes into my head or if I see someone doing one that I want to say, no, that's not the top 10. And I'll do a top 10 list. I did start by also maybe reviewing and unboxing new tech and stuff like that that I was getting in. So I, I really don't know what I'm doing with it yet. That's <laughs> the best way to describe what I'm doing. I'm just, I'll wake up in the morning because I only tend to have one day to do anything for YouTube. And that's my day off work on a Thursday. And I'll wake up that day and I'll just say to myself, that's what I'm going to do today. And I've got like five hours to do it. So that's that's uh, at the moment i've i really haven't found my voice yet give it time and uh, you know that's it I, I, obviously you go back and you watch your earlier videos and oh no i can't do that <laughs> they suck. i mean they, they do i mean not yours i mean but mine was awful but i love going back just to see how much progress you're making on the platform it's it's quite, it astounded me because it was only last week I sat down and said, right, it's time to watch your first video again. I tend to do it maybe every two or three months. I watch that first video and I can look at my most recent upload and say, yes, you're starting to understand what you're doing with this now. So so keep going, just keep doing it week by week, learn a bit and then move on. And it's also the best bit of advice anyone's given me is if you want to do it, you just sit down and do it. Mm. Release it out into the wild. Watch it back and say to yourself, right, how can I do it a little bit better next time and then move on? But but as for the channel, yeah, it's it's mostly gaming. It's actually almost exclusively gaming now. And even when it was tech related, it was graphics cards for my PC or upgrades for that or different options for playing older games on modern TVs and stuff like that. So it's always been gaming. It's it's always going to be gaming with me, though. So I don't well, know what else to say. <laughs> all right, then let's see. Uh, this is a curious thing. I wanted to ask everyone this in past podcasts, but I always forget because I'm an idiot. What's your favourite console and why? Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Have I asked a real head scratch? I mean... Though? I mean, I mean, I'm looking across from myself just now, and I've got 13 consoles all hooked up and ready to go. That's what I like. Someone that's just got to press a few switches in order to change consoles. That's, that's exactly what that's I it. have. They're, they're all there. They're ready to go, and it just depends what mood I'm in. Uh, I mean... I'll tell you what, while you have a think, then I'll tell you a little story. Like, like you, I have a right. bunch of consoles plugged in, and it's just a case of press a few buttons when you want to play this. 
Uh, the last interview I did on this uh, podcast was Retro Wolf 88. That hasn't come out yet, but it was the last one I did. And um, he talked about Metroid Prime for his retro game. And since then, I thought, fuck it, I want to play that game again. I haven't beaten it. I want to play it again. Me, I don't have the GameCube plugged in downstairs. I've got the Wii plugged in. So, you know, same shit, does the same stuff. I was having a fight and a battle. The Wii would not work my GameCube control. I'm like, yeah, mother fucking piece of dog shit, cunt twat. Yes, this is an explicit podcast, in case you have not yet been informed. Trying to get this bastard controller to work, doing everything I could. Give up. Try another controller. It's not working. Things fucked. The Wii's fucked. Unplug it. Pull the thing out. Look at it. Oh, I had it in controller port too. (laughs) <laughs> what a dick I am as soon as I put it in like playing the game and I'm not angry I'm not angry I'm not even thinking about it anymore my god I'm pissed at myself all that yanking around with wires and being a dick and it was because I had the wrong fucking thing in. but anyway have you had a chance to think about console <sighs> the best way to answer it is if I was only allowed one console what would it be and Ooh. it would probably be the PlayStation 2 as obviously People listening won't be able to see that as a sort of wall of PlayStation 2 games behind there. That is there. a big-ass wall. To be fair, I've got the same amount, probably, but I have to stack all mine away, and I've got them in a massive CD wallet that the wife can't pick up. Oh, no, no, not CD wallets. I know, I know. I don't have the space. Because I collect so many cartridge yeah. games, they take up fucking yeah. everything. So, Yeah, I would have to say the PlayStation 2 just purely for the games that I could go back to time and time again and time and time again. <laughs> so, yeah, PlayStation it? 2. Do you watch DVDs on it still, then? Uh, no, I don't watch DVDs on it, no. <laughs> I still I mean, do. that's that's what the PlayStation 5's for. <laughs> I don't have one of them yet. Mind you, I haven't gone looking for one. Well, I got one at launch. Uh, I was, I'm a Sony pony. If anybody who watches a Sony channel, pony, I've not heard that. Just, That's actually quite clever. I'm a Sony pony. I mean, throw my hands up. I've got no shame in that whatsoever. Sony haven't done me wrong since 1996 when I first picked up the the PlayStation. They haven't done me wrong. So yeah, when the PlayStation Five was sort of announced, I opened a bank account, started saving into that, knew that I was going to buy it and launch. It was simple as that. And then when it came out with the price it came out at 450 quid, I had enough to buy a new PC. I had saved so much because I was dreading how much it was going to cost based on the specs. But yes, I used that top of the range console there to play DVDs, not the PlayStation 2. (laughs) Well, at least you've got a good use for it. So right, there we are. We have covered you. We've covered your name, what channel name, and now we've covered your channel and favourite console. I think we're all good. And in because people can't see you, of course, uh, this is very relaxed when it comes to the video stuff because you can get the podcast on a bunch of places, but also YouTube in case people don't know that shit. I notice your hair is blue a lot of the time, so you must be heavily inspired by Ninja. <laughs> no, I'm not heavily inspired by Ninja. <laughs> I thought and you were going to tell me that... to fuck off then. <laughs> I haven't, no, I haven't heard that comment for about a year and a half. It was one of the first people ever who commented on a video of mine. Someone that I didn't know that is, was, uh, I think she was a young Spanish girl, and she just said, well, it looks like Ninja's going downhill. And I went, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> I had no idea about YouTube, remember? Yeah. Everything I was doing was new and fresh. And, Ninja? Ninja what? <laughs> so yeah, I haven't heard a Ninja comment for quite a while. You're the first in a long time. Yeah, I'm imaginative or not. Depends <laughs> how you look at it. So anyway, we're going to get into your modern game for today first. And I will have to say this will shock people, but it's a Sega franchise. And I've never played one of them. Not a single one. I own like four but I've not played one. Yes, I am a dick. And I don't have an excuse <laughs> for not playing this. But basically, your game of the day is Yakuza Like a Dragon. Why have you picked that as your modern game? Why? Well, like you, I have 
before Like a Dragon, I had never played a single Yakuza game. Not one. I don't I, feel so bad now. I, Good. Well, they were... They looked like they were light RPG action games. And yes, there's subtitle on them. And it doesn't bother me, the subtitles on them. But when I'm playing a game, I don't want to be reading at the same time. Now, I've You're been not told... Into that, eh? I've just I've been told that the, the subtitles and all that's away from the action. It won't spoil your enjoyment of the game. But I, it was just something that turned me off. I mean, it probably a throwback to I'm gonna here we go on a tangent, but a throwback to Crouching <laughs> Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Now that was a movie that I was desperate to see. Desperate to see. Now the only seat that I could get in the cinema was right in the front row. And it was one of the bigger screens. So my head was literally having to go left to right, left to right, while <laughs> I was trying to read the subtitles, which were spanning way off to my, my left to right, and then oh, try and yeah. keep up with the action. So yeah, when I found out there was subtitles in the game as well, it's like, I don't want to be reading while I'm playing. I mean, you're going to find out as we go along with the games I picked that I do read a lot in the games that I play. But the thought of reading while the action was going on, well, it was just too much for me. So I steered away for the Yakuza games. Like a Dragon, however, I was told was a proper JRPG. And it's another thing you'll probably get if you ever watch my channel is that I love my RPGs, especially the JRPGs. And I only just played it in December past. So it's not like I ran out and got it straight away. This was like the end of last year. And I thought, right, I've got another month I've got no game to play I'll take Yakuza like a dragon out for a spin and all I can say about the game is that absolutely blew my socks off to coin a phrase because I had never experienced a modern JRP that was so truthful and so oh, respectful of traditional JRPGs from back in the mid 90s with Yakuza Like a Dragon, again, the concept of this was brilliant. Your main character in the game, Ichiban, he, he's a fan of Dragon Age. Eh, no Dragon Age, Dragon Quest, another great JRPG series. And I'm thinking, how do they work Dragon Quest into a Yakuza game? A game about, you know, gangland, gangland thugs and people who want to, you know, murder people or... They're, they're mobsters. How does this work with Dragon Quest? And the main character lives his life as if he is a Dragon Quest character. So when you go into the combat in the game, he then imagines himself doing everything he's doing in turn base. So right. that's that, so the that's game switches to turn. Yeah, the game turns into turn based traditional JRPG mechanics, and oh, it's fantastic. And it's so true to original JRPGs, it's scary. I remember when this uh, came out and you see all the trailers popping out all over fucking YouTube and everywhere else. It was, I don't know, the first Yakuza to stand out just in appearance. Because again, I've not played a single Yakuza game. Yes, I'm a dick. But this one, <laughs> for some reason, just always looks so different. The main character looks like he's a, well, basically a nutty cartoon idiot. But Aside from that, I don't know much of anything. But now you're saying he imagines he's in an RPG, then it becomes turn-based. It sounds a bit batshit insane. Do you have to play older Yakuza games to play this one? Uh, well, I hadn't played a single one. And uh, after maybe about, I don't know, 30 hours of it, I declared it as one of my top 10 games, without mm. a doubt, hands down. It, I absolutely it knocked it out of the park when it came to being a traditional JRPG. Yes, it's nutty. It's it's absolutely bizarre. But the Yakuza games, from what I can gather from what I've seen of the other Yakuza games, there is an element of that kind of slightly nuttiness to them anyway. But with this one, oh yeah, it's it's to a new level. It's up to 11, the nuttiness. I mean, I don't want to spoil it because obviously a JRPG is story-driven and I don't want to give away story to anyone who's not played the game. Yeah. But summons that you get in most JRPGs, your big magic. One of these summons is a Yakuza patriarch who dresses up as a baby. 
What? What? He dresses he dresses up as a baby, and what when you summon him, you you summon him, he'll come flying into the the, the battle and start screaming and crying at the the enemy bad guys and spraying them with bottles of milk and stuff like that. And that's your I mean that's it. That's what your summon does to destroy that set of bad guys you're fighting at that time. It's absolutely mental. And this is not the only example of how cr- crazy this game is. I mean, if you like your games, you know, just not quite right in the head, then this is definitely one that's up your street. And as I said, I love traditional JRPGs, but this was it was so respectful to the genre, but still had that Yakuza craziness stamped all over it. It, it made it special. It made it really special. You see, I, I want to try it now. I'm very intrigued, but I'm such a prat that when it comes to these sort of games, I have to go back to the, the start. Whenever I find out, oh, that game looks really cool, but it's like the ninth one, so I've got to go and get the first one, which I think I have on PS2, I hope. So I'll have to play that. It's probably shit. I've heard good things <laughs> about Yakuza 2. One, I never hear anything. So no. I'm probably in for a bad time. <laughs> but I keep thinking of this game along the way there. So you can't tell us about story. Fair enough. Um, graphics and all that. We know it looks nuts. What's the music like? Oh, the music's fantastic. I mean, it's what you would expect from a tradition, well, a, a modern JRPG like Persona that it's high paced, it's well paced music. It's and it's of course it's it's all based in Japan, so you're getting a lot of Japanese influence on it there as well. The music's fantastic, but it's the gameplay. The it's the gameplay that absolutely I, it it destroyed any preconceptions I had of where JRPGs were going. And what I'm going to say to that is Final Fantasy VII remake. I played oh. that and I enjoyed it. Now I'm a huge Final Fantasy VII fan. I played the remake and enjoyed it for what it was. It's not Final Fantasy VII, not by any it. stretch of them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I've been wanting to do this for ages. Few people have beaten it on here. Everyone, if you don't want a little bit of a spoiler, I'm not going to go into detail, but if you don't want a spoiler, you can skip ahead a little bit or not give a fuck or whatever. The ending of the remake. What the fuck? What the fuck did they do? I don't get it, and I hate it. It's time shit. So, what did you think when you did the ending of uh, the remake of Seven? The I know we've gone off most... topic, but I have to cover no. this. I hate it. Yeah, the, the same as most other people assumed at the time. They were throwing in all this, the fates and what have you, just so they don't have to stick to the story once they get outside of Midgar. Why they couldn't they just they stick want. to the story? Is what we bloody yeah, want. That's that's exactly what we wanted. So that's why I say when I say I enjoyed Final Fantasy VII Remake, I enjoyed it for what it was, but it's not Final Fantasy VII. Now, no. coming back to the point I was trying to make was <laughs> with Yakuza. If Final Fantasy VII had been made like Yakuza, it would have been my greatest game of all time. Final hmm. Fantasy VII, and that it's what I wanted from Final Fantasy VII. Obviously, so a different Fan- story. Yeah, Final Fantasy VII Remake, what it needed was a bit of Yakuza like a dragon within it. Then. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, you don't need to play the other Yakuza games first because it's a completely new character as well. Is it like that each time, do you know, or...? I don't think so. I think for the original Yakuza games, you're playing as the one character, or it's his big story arc. Whereas, mm. like a dragon, you're starting fresh with Ichiban. He's a new character. Good. Maybe that would be worth jumping yeah. to then. It, certainly. I mean, it didn't take anything away from me. People say, of course, that if you played the other Yakuza games, you're you might lift a bit more from it. But yeah, I'm sure main... there's some little bits from the other games in there that they don't matter, you know, the sort of shit. So, yeah, I mean, it's like the Mandalorian and Knights of the New Republic. Those parts. I was just thinking that. And, I didn't say. It. Yeah. 
there's parts in that where if you've you played the game and watched the Mandalorian, then oh, you you get a little smile out of that. Mm. But uh, your cursor like a dragon. From what what I took from it was it's a it's its own entity, and it's a new character. <clears throat> so yeah, jump in and if if you want that, if you want to see what Final Fantasy VII remake could have been, then play Yakuza like a dragon. That's I have to try that because I'm very intrigued by the way you've described that, how Final Fantasy VII needed that. Because, you know, I I liked Seven Remake's gameplay. Its music mm-hmm. was awesome. The little nods yep. to the original. There weren't enough of them. There should have been fucking more, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I mean, hell, the material's there. It's meant to be a remake. But, yeah, I hated all the new shit they threw in. My favourite bit of Final Fantasy VII Remake was when I, I once got lost and wandered around forever, uh, getting more powerful, training up and all that. And I thought, oh, I'm going to go right here, dick. So basically, I wasn't looking at the map because I'm a tosser. Finally went the right way. But because of all that, I felt quite powerful, quite cocky, thinking, hey, I could take on fucking anything. And then you go down one little corridor or whatever. Some goons come along, say so they'll knock you out and all that. Come on in. Come and have a go. Let's fucking see what you're made of. And they say, get out the monster or whatever. Monster, ah, go on then. What is it? And then you see a green foot and then a brown cloak. You go, Oh no, it's fucking Tonbury dead. <laughs> Don't yeah. matter how powerful you are. But that was no. my favorite bit because I felt so cocky and so powerful. It's like, Oh shit. <laughs> but I love yeah. that. That's my favorite bit. Not the story, not the characters, none of that shit. It's fucking Tonbury. So I'm just really interested to see how you think Yakuza Like a Dragon would have improved it. So I have to play it now to see. So I've got you to do certainly that. do, yeah. You know what? I'm starting to hate this podcast because there's all these fucking games I keep finding out about that I have to play. It's like, shit! Like I have any money anyway. So what we will do does, is... Oh, no, go on. And it's not only that. Another thing that you'll get great enjoyment from is the Sega clubs within the game. So you can go into these Sega arcades and play... Space Harrier and Virtua Fighter arcade ports on your modern console. Oh, no. You play the arcade machine, you walk up to the arcade machine and and there's so many mini games littered through it. Like there was in Final Fantasy VII when you went to Gold Tosser. You know how you had yeah. lots of different mini games and arcades? You could imagine that, but closer to what it's actually like to be in an arcade. So, so it did a bit of a Shenmue then? Yeah, I mean, it, it's sort of in the same universe, is it not? It's Shenmue. Uh, not a I, I clue. believe I, I believe it is. I believe that they're sort of in this shared universe. So, yeah, you, you've got those Sega clubs, and they, oh. they've even got a Mario Kart ripoff. I mean, you a Mario just, Kart ripoff. Yeah, it's called Dragon Kart, and it's one of the side quests. The side quests. Normally, people complain about the side quests in a game because they don't really do anything but pad the game and mm. like a dragon you get so much enjoyment like the dragon carts you go to a side quest and it's it's a little guy with a bunch of go-karts and he says right do you want to race and that's what you can sit and do for a couple of hours just race like mario kart but in the yakuza world around the, the streets of the, the city okay. it's i need this game now god damn you damn you why can't and you know what whoever i get on next i'm going to tell him you're only allowed to pick crap games no more good ones i can't afford it (laughs) right so moving on to a game that luckily i already have in one format we're going on to your retro game i'll be interested to see why you've picked this one but you're going for suikoden 2 two why not any of the others well to be honest with you when i think about say coding two i think about two and one at the same time because what i felt about say coding two was that was the game that they wanted to make if you play say coding and say coding two back to back which i tend to do on an almost annual basis 
Bloody hell, how it's, long does that take? It doesn't take too long. It's only about, what, 30 hours each. Is it? I'm, yeah, I'm, I mean... I'm well, not beaten either. I've, but, oh, if I'm as if good you, as you, right. If you've played, <laughs> if you've played it a lot, yeah. And yeah. even... It depends whether you want to go for all 108 stars of destiny as well. So, but yeah, I play them uh, back to back, and I play them on the Vita, so I can play them on the go. Because oh, obviously, uh, the you, can one buy them. you have where you have it. You don't own the disc. I have, I have owned both of them twice, and sold both of them twice. <laughs> oh. I know, I know. It's sore point, and I'll probably buy them both again. Aren't because they a fucking bomb right now? You're looking at about 300 quid for two and 150 for the first one. So yes, they're, they're, they're pricey. I will yeah. get them again, but that will be something that I'll decide when I want it. I'll start saving for it and eventually just get it and bite the bullet yeah. again, despite having sold them both twice. I uh, I got someone, it was a long-term viewer of my channel once saying, oh, I want you to do a Let's Play of Sui Coden 2. I said, how the fuck do you expect me to do that then? And they said, you can get it very, very cheap on PS3. Yeah. Like, right, yeah. well, then that I will do. So that's how I own it. I don't own the fucking Yeah, well, that's, that's how I own them now as well. I've got mm. 1, 2, and 3 on the PlayStation 3 or the Vita. Well, I can't play 3 in the Vita because that was a PlayStation 2 game. Yeah. I think you can get many of the others on there can't you maybe like four four five. yeah four as well four you can get but i've got four or five and tactics up there oh, anyway right. i mean they're fairly reasonable they're they're only about 50 pounds a pop or something like that so only he says for a jrpg i mean well, yeah i'll give you that from that era i'll give you that i mean i mean it's part of the problem with the pricing is that obviously Japan didn't think the West could cope with these games because the first two coding game was released in 95. It was like a launch title game, but it was 97 before we got over here, the first two coding game. I didn't know it was and like was, a launch game, so I learned a thing. And it was probably only because of Final Fantasy VII. Makes sense. That, that they've said, oh, the Western audience are ready for JRPG. Yeah. Let's send them some. And <laughs> They're not as you. thick anymore. They finally learned no. their lessons. They've, yeah. Bastards. So, um, all right, we can't go into too much detail of the story, but I don't think anyone would care if we covered, like, the the background and the, the starting bit, because obviously you start in, like, a, uh army camp, but, of course, this is swords and back-in-the-day medieval sort of thing. When There's no yeah. guns and no shite like that. So, um, what can you tell us about the start of the story and the background? Well, the background of the games, the background, background of Sui Coden is quite fascinating because it's based on the water margin, which is, uh, what I think that's a 13th century Chinese book, novel. I mean, classic literature about 108 uh, outlaws who decided to band together to overthrow the, the government. And oh. that's pretty much true to the game. I mean, if you, if you want to get up to speed on the water margin, they made a TV series, a mini series in the 70s. I mean, it was something I sat and watched with my grandmother back, you know, in the, the late 70s, you know, when you didn't get control over the TV. And <laughs> she, wanted, she wanted to watch that. So, I mean, I sat and watched the water margin, which is a, an old Japanese mini series from the... I think it was 72, 73 when that came out. I never heard and, of it. At least I don't think I have. Well, it's something else for you to Google, the water margin. But yes, yeah, the so learning it's based... and shit I have to do via this podcast. <sighs> Such a bad idea. I was happy being <laughs> thick. So yeah, it's based it's based on a, a traditional Chinese story about these 108 outlaws who decided to band together to overthrow the government, which was corrupt, which, you know, it's, it's an age-old tale and it's a modern tale as well, so it's, it's one very anyone can... accurate way you of can putting relate it, to yeah. it. You can relate to it wherever you are in history. Mm. And it, the thing is, being a video game, it's fantastically suited for it because you start off with your main character and his best friend in this army camp. And there's obviously an ambush and... You get separated from your army and you're off out into the wild yourself. 
And the whole point of the game is to find the 108 stars of destiny. That's 108 almost playable characters that you can bring into your group. Fucking that you can 108. use 108. That puts Chrono across yeah. to shame. Well, when I when I tend to speak about say coding to people who have no experience of it, they immediately say, "So it's like Pokemon." But if it is, it's Pokemon before Pokemon was a thing. Hmm. Because you're you're going out there and you're collecting characters for your party, so you can battle with those characters. So you're going out there beating up people and then capturing them in small tiny balls. Well, no, you tend to you the side quest to collect the people you're you're doing them favors or you're trying to convince them to join your army it sounds like quite a detailed story i only played that a little bit because it was a let's play course you can only you, do so much you you have no idea the depth that they put into the story as well because if you do sit i mean there's something that would take you hundreds of hours to sit and read every parchment you could come across or listen to everyone's story because it's drawn from that ancient Chinese novel, that's all in there. All the history between the even the NPCs, never mind the 108 that you can collect and bring into your army, and that all are they're all unique, which is was astounding for the time. It's still astounding, to be honest with you. Well, and I've got uh, the information here from uh, Wikipedia on the game, just to refresh certain stuff. And this is something that I've only ever seen once before. It says um, greatest video games of all time. I've only ever seen that once before, and that was with Minecraft. So that's a <laughs> big statement to have for any fucking game. Doesn't matter how good it is to see people say that. That really speaks volumes. It's considered one of the uh, mm, greatest classics in the style of the game you know rpg yeah. yet the funny thing is you look down at reviews you got egm they've given it a seven out of ten uh metacritic honestly fuck metacritic i don't know why they exist 82 out of 100 so it's got a few fairish reviews but the others are all nines out of tens you know so it's weird if you're big into rpgs it seems like this is a staple this is considered a big point in rpg history but maybe a bit overwhelming for people that aren't so big into RPGs? What do you reckon of that? Would you consider that a truth? To get the most out of the game, yes, you need to delve into the game. You need to become completely absorbed with what's happening because there are so many characters and they are all important to the plot as you go along. You can run through it, as I said, uh, like most other RPGs and just level up one group of characters and get from a to B. Hmm. But with Sui Code, and it's such a big story, if you want to properly get through it, then you've got a lot of reading ahead of you. And you've got a lot of different characters to meet and understand. And, and it all carries on from the first game as well. So the characters in the first game, a good selection of them carry over to the second game. So would you say you have to play one to play two? No, absolutely not. As my opinion is, Two Code and Two was a game that they wanted to make, but they either didn't have the time, the money, or the technology, or whatever. Probably a bit of everything games, there, right? But everything. I mean, it was, it was a launch title basically for the PlayStation, which is weird because it's also sixteen-bit sprite. Yeah. Graphics. Thinking it's about not, that. I mean, yeah, everyone was going, it's got to be polygons, it's got to be 3D, it's got to be, you know, Final Fantasy VII. And fortunately, so you called and they said, no, we, we don't need to do that. We can make sure this game still looks awesome in 20 years' time. Yeah, if, that, if they had gone 3D, it'd probably look like some sort of jade cocoon fuck yeah. up, you know what I mean? It would blatantly look like that, actually, wouldn't it? Horrid. Yeah, exactly like that. The only uh, but, old school 3D-ish game from that sort of genre that doesn't look like shit now to me is Grandia. Oh, Grandia is fantastic. Yeah. I'm still waiting for someone to talk about that, but it hasn't happened yet. So you missed your chance oh. on that. Fuck you. <laughs> it, it could have been on the list. I've just picked it up from PlayAsia, the HD remaster. Grandia HD remaster. Ah. So it's got one and two on it. And 
two I love is uh, Grandia. We're, we're you, not talking about Grandia. See, no, no, you, but I need to know. You managed to get a physical one. Yeah, I'm a cunt. Yeah, I've got a physical one. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know there was one. Yeah, pl- uh, pleasure of doing it. Play and, yeah. Have I bought the digital It's a one? danger website. It's a danger website. It's, yeah. So I'm not doing very well today, people. I'm finding all these little pits for me to spend money in. So, shit. Don't know what I'm going to do about that. I feel bad. You're there, like, being an adult and having just a Coke to keep you going, and I've got a cider, so whoops. Well, I don't don't drink anymore. I don't drink. But you're Scottish. Yeah, I know, but I got <laughs> drunk once. I got drunk once, and I've Honest. done it, you know? Yeah, it was the 90s. I got drunk in the 90s, and... I mean, all of the 90s. Oh, right. I got drunk once and I made it last, right? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I'd, I'd done all my drinking in the 90s because I'm much older than I look as well, which is another thing. Hmm. Don't know if I should ask that or not. Go for it. Take a guess. Oh, crap. I suck at this game. Um, shit, right, 70s. So you're a bit older than me. I'm going to say 40. Two. I will be 50 years old in about what, 10 months' time. Fuck my old boots. <laughs> he doesn't look him. I mean, he's got blue hair. So he doesn't That's right, look don't check out the channel if you don't believe. You know, I've watched some of your videos. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> I've no, you, your... I'm talking to the... The poor souls that are listening now. <laughs> well, there you go. I, I've watched uh, some of your videos. Like, the only thing is, everyone berates me this. How come you don't watch my videos, Tom? How come you don't do this? I do. I watch all of YouTube on my PS3. I can't leave a fucking comment. That's why no one believes me. <laughs> well, you know, I do the same thing. I watch on the PlayStation 5 just now, but I've always got my phone in my hand. Oh, the missus so my doesn't hands... go at me for having the phone in my hand all the time. She just says, put that fucking thing down. <laughs> You're like a oh, teenager, I'm... but uglier. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> but yeah. No, uh, yeah, the same problem. Uh, if you're watching on a console, you can't comment. It's as simple as that. So I've learned to have my, my phone in my hand. Because uh, comments yeah. are what... Uh, they're a big part of YouTube for me as well, I suppose, going back to the earlier question. So yeah, it's it interaction good, with the um... community. Yeah, it's astounding when you first get into it and you get random people, you've no idea who they are, leaving comments yeah. in your videos, just thinking, holy shit. Especially when you just start out, that's weird, isn't it? It was weird for me because it was all people from North America. I didn't yes. meet a single UK-based YouTube channel until it must have been about February. after The February after I started, so three three months or whatever, three, four months. It was only American viewers. And I think they said it was the accent that drew them in. So, You know what? This, this is how the proof that I should write notes. But this, I let the podcast go in a sort of flow where it's just natural and we don't have it all pre-programmed. We had forgotten to mention that you are the host for YouTuber of the Month. How the fuck did we forget that? <laughs> I, th- I think the proper title is YouTuber of the Year. Yes, you are the title <laughs> owner of that. You own the trophy. So I'll tell you yes. what, we'll uh, finish talking about Sui Coden, but before we get onto the indie, then we'll cover that because we should have covered it okay. earlier, but fuck it. Yeah. Watch me forget again, everyone. Right, so Sui Coden, we've mentioned the graphics. Awesome, old school anime, 2D, thank fuck, because if they had gone Music. 3D, it wouldn't have been very good. No. Music, Music. beautiful. Where would you rate Just- it? Pick a famous, like, between Grandia and uh, what's a really shit JRPG on the fucking PlayStation? You don't remember the shit ones. Um, That's the problem. You don't remember the shit ones, do you? No. How close would you rate it to, say, one of the epics? Because, you know, Final Fantasy VII had some of the best old-school RPG music on PS1. Most of the Final Fantasies did. Final Fantasy VII is one of my favourites. Mm. I would, If Final Fantasy was a 10, I would put Sui Coden at an 8. A fair eight. Hmm. Yeah, a fair eight. Yeah. I mean, it's very gentle music. It's in, it's in the same style as having 16-bit graphics, sprite work. It's 16 bitish music. It's not quite that bad. It's not chiptune or anything like that. Well, no. But I mean, it's, it's not overbearing. I get what you mean. I mean, when you think of seven, 
that was before we branched into the orchestral side. You listen to music yeah. from Final Fantasy VII, then you listen to eight. It's like, oh, is this on the same console? Yeah. And I can see why, like, the younger generation would make that mistake just from the sound alone. There is a big step up. But there's nothing wrong with, like, seven and fucking sewer code and two. It's just, it's before the game designers knew how to do that, I reckon. That was it. It was before they were used to the CD-based media. They'd, they'd never had that space before. The, you no, know. they they did entire things on one fucking keyboard. And yeah. now it's like, right, we've got to get a guy in who plays violin. Why? What are you going to do with Because him? we can do it now. <laughs> oh, shit. Right, okay. <laughs> so there we are. we have that with the music. I can't think what else to say about Sui Code. And it's been so long since I've played it. It just looks like it's one of them games that you have to try, but it's not easy to unless you own a PS3, really. Yeah, or a Vita. Yeah. It doesn't it's seem still... like it's on anything else, which is a bit you can of a buy the. You can buy the PlayStation 1 Classic version on the PlayStation 3 store, and I play it on a Vita. I don't play it on a big screen anymore. So, No, what, are you more into the handheld when it comes to that? I was never into handhelds. I'm still not. I'm only just getting into handhelds again. But when it comes to that, because of the art style, it just plays beautifully on a, a small handheld screen. It's, I can see that. I can see it's what old you school. mean that, yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about Sui Code? No, just I want to agree with whoever made that comment on Wikipedia is definitely one of the best JRPGs you'll ever play. And for me, it's up there with Final Fantasy VII and they constantly battle each other for what should be number one. So We keep it's... referencing Final Fantasy VII today, people. I don't know why. <laughs> but it just seems fitting for half of it, doesn't it? Yeah. Right, so before we go on to your final game of the day, the indie game, let's cover you being YouTuber of the year. So did you think for a moment, of course, that you would win? No, not, Good. not for one moment. <laughs> I hate vain people, so I'm glad you feel that way. Now, I've talked about this before with uh, Bill Thorpe, made, uh, Games Made of Cardboard, how last year there was a lot of toxicity and a lot of bad shit going on around it. It was the first year to have so much, uh, should we say, poison going on around everything. It was quite yep. crappy. I like. Um, I don't know if they want me to mention them, so I won't. But there's a few YouTubers that have put up with certain shit. Some people had backed out, didn't want to have to put up with that crap. What did you see going on at the time? Do you see any of this shit? I, I was quite fortunate on the personal side of things that I didn't see or experience any any of this, other than secondhand information coming from you know other channels. You know, mm. this that was what my exposure to what it was. What I kind of noticed was that I think YouTuber of the Month got itself into one small pool and started yeah, to exactly. stagnate. Yeah. It got it stuck. Started to stag it got stuck and stagnated and it was the same sort of group that was in all the time. So there was going to be resentment, I believe. Yeah. There wasn't enough people to keep the thing flowing, to keep it fresh and and after seeing that, that was the reason that I decided to put my name forward with the, op with the chance to become the host for this year. So. so why did you, despite all of this happening, was it just you wanted to get it out of this fucking pool of the same people, the same band of friends? You thought, no, let's push yes. it out there, get it out so there's Americans involved, uh, Germans, Europeans, everyone. It hasn't got to just be this one group of friends somewhere in Britain I believe yeah absolutely I mean it was coming up to the point where Scott Sega Zombie last year's host mm. was asking people whether they wanted to go forward again to be you know next year's host and it was right at the head of all the the bad feeling that seemed to be within this particular pool at the time and I said to myself, yeah, I'm going to go forward for it because I know if I go forward with it, I get to change the rules. Not dramatically, but enough to ensure that it will become an international celebration again. And that's another thing. It's I want to take away the notion that this is a competition. 
Because yes, there's winners and losers, but not really. What is supposed to be is a celebration of the YouTube gaming community, where we all get to meet new people and experience new channels and reach out to places that we might never have done before. Mm. It's a and, great sort of advertisement for the lower YouTuber, isn't it? Well, that's that. I mean, when, I mean, I just started. Well, I started in the September of 2020. And I was nominated for YouTuber in a month in April. So it was six months. And within that six months, I had under 100 subs. And all of that was from North America. I was at a whole big North America community, which was fantastic. And I got to meet and still know a lot of wonderful people uh, through that. But when I got nominated into that, yes, it did. It propelled me to, you know, 200 subs, 300 subs, 400 subs. So yeah, it, it, it does do that for your channel. But I also noticed the channels that were nominated back when I was nominated and for the, the couple of months before that, they've also done well out of it. Not through winning their particular month, but just being noticed, putting out content on a regular basis and people coming back. It's mm. I just wanted to make it a celebration of the community rather than a competition. There so is no what, prize. I didn't get a trophy or a crown when, you know, I was... I did. I've got a little trophy the on my shelf. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, won a, I didn't get a trophy a or a YouTuber crown. of the month thing. That's... Yeah, do you know, they when they were hosting it, they made these little trophies for everyone. It's like, why did you spend money on this? It's awesome, though, because everyone Because that's Tom and Lacey. Yeah, they're the dogs. <laughs> that's Tom and Lacey. They're awesome. That's, they're, they are awesome people. And part of that community that you know that I was involved with first mm. so what you get is you get the opportunity to then put some and it's hard work as well doing the hosting because you've got to look after the competition so you're not a winner <laughs> but what I found from winning from it was just meeting new people and that was the whole point is this celebration of the community which had all went away we were seeing the same people in the nominations time and time again, that was one of the things I took away. You can't be nominated twice in the same year. Not in my year anyway. I mean, once it moves on, it's up to the next host. But also uh, I ensured that there was two categories. I wanted three nominations to be under 500 subs, but two to be over up to the 1,000. So there's two larger channels and with a smaller channel. So the audiences from both sides get to see each other. Mm. And the final rule I made was from each of those categories, one has to be out with your own home country. As simple as that. I'm it's, so glad you made that rule because last year, the whole time I was thinking, if only uh, Sega Zombie would just implant that rule, he could fix this shit. Or at least it would stand a chance of it, the best he could control, you know. Well, yeah, I spoke, well, I contacted Scott about it and he said he that was one of his biggest regrets oh. was not carrying that on, carrying on something like that. And it, he came to me and said, you've got to do something about, you know, getting it out there and getting it fresh again. And I goes, don't worry, that's exactly why I put my name forward. So, mm. well, I'm, I want I'm, it glad, to get I'm so glad someone's got the brain power to figure out what needs to be done to fix this shit. And it looks like it's already happening. Things seem to be going well at the start. And well, um, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's only it's, the beginning, isn't it? You've only just started. What I've found is as good as the channels that get nominated want it to be, they'll they'll get out of it what they put into it. Yes. So I, if you get nominated and you start telling people, I've been nominated, come and have a look at this and stuff like that, then you'll do well. Yeah. I mean, cause people love that stuff. You know, let's go and check it out. I'm trying to remember the people I nominated. I only have a one YouTuber of the month. Uh, I backed out for the year things like, no, we don't want to do that. That's a responsibility that's too scary. Um, I know I nominated, a, I beat a guy named Gaming Muso, who does music for YouTube. Uh, no, sorry. He does video game music and he, t he converts it onto guitar. He does a fucking fantastic job of that. But apparently I'd beaten him by one bloody vote. So I said, I'm nominating him because he deserves another go, because if I had been beaten by one vote, that would suck. So I said, <laughs> I'm giving him a fair chance, because there was no rule saying I, someone couldn't be nominated yeah, twice. No. So bollocks. No. Um, and the only other person I remember nominating was uh, 
YK2K is this young lad, quite young, and he does drawings of anime and manga and stuff like that. He's big into his games, but he's young and he's not one of these dicks going around eating, washing up liquid and all this shit, all this crap. He just looked like someone that was trying to have fun game wise and show a bit of art. And I thought, that's the kind yeah. of thing I want to promote on YouTube with young people. I want more young people doing that than the crap they are doing, yeah, unfortunately. Absolutely. So that's all I remember. But in terms of rules being changed from uh, hosts, the only other time I can think of that was uh, Gaming Off The Grid because they had some shit where apparently British people were going mad at them saying, you know, this was a British thing first, you've stolen it. And it was like, what do you mean stolen it? <laughs> It came from Canada first, I think. Yeah, Jason Relaxation, he's not from the UK. <laughs> I mean, he's no. definitely North American. I don't know if he's a Canadian channel or... I, I think so, but US. I might be wrong. Maybe he's just so North America he's, he's, is there. He's definitely North American, yeah, mm. Jason Relaxation. And after winning it, I sort of went down the rabbit hole of YouTuber of the month. Not the, the uh, year, you, the, the month I won. It, and yeah. I'd, I just went back and tried to find everything that I could. I mean, you can see that in the uh, for the titles for YouTuber of the Month. There's Jason Relaxation on the screen first, and it'll flip through various you know winners and nominees of all the past what eleven years, and it's been going longer than eleven years because Jason used to just do it himself. I think he'd done two years where he was just saying, "I'm picking these channels. I want you to vote on them." And it wasn't until, you know, 11 years ago, he said, right, I've done this for a while. Do you want to try it to the next channel? And that's where that grew from. So it was just a tiny seed, a tiny idea from one channel that has bloomed into what should be and hopefully will be this wonderful celebration of all us nutbag gamers on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I, I really hope it gets some of that. Uh, I don't know. Some of it sold back because it did seem a bit yeah. crushed last year no fault of sega zombie yeah i think he should have uh implemented the one rule where you should pick people that aren't from britain people who are abroad yeah. basically yeah that's not a fuck up that's something i think he would have benefited from but i don't think he fucked up from not doing it you know he no did the best he, he could said in, in the situation yeah he said in hindsight you wish he had it was but hindsight's 2020 <laughs> well yeah well fuck that year who could anticipate what he had to go through with uh like all of that you one youtuber 50 accounts trolling the fuck out of people as we said some people backed out like not dealing with that so you don't expect people to be that toxic people are that toxic but yes they are yeah yeah humans suck so I've, i think we covered that we should have covered it at the start so i apologize everyone out that's my fault i forgot i'm a shit person whoops so now we will uh move on unless you is there anything else you'd like to say about youtube of the month oh uh, just Check it out every month and check out the five channels that have been nominated and vote on one of them. Yes, please yes. vote. Yeah. And vote with your heart and your head. You know? Yes, use your head and smash that keyboard. Yeah. Absolutely. Also, there will, of course, be links to YouTube of the month and, of course, Generation Pixel within the description of this podcast. I would have said that at the end of the podcast, and I will anyway, but I'm saying it now because I've proven that I'm forgetting things today. Go me. <laughs> So we'll move on to your indie game. Now, I've only uh, just brought up the name of the indie game, so I've got the right thing as a reference. I don't know what this game is, everyone. I'd heard of the other two, played one of them. This one, haven't got a fucking Scoobies. Stories Untold. Why have you picked that as your indie game? Mostly because I don't play a lot of indie games. Really? Are you not much of yeah. a Switch player? Because Nintendo Switch has got a fuck ton of them. I have just acquired my first Switch. Just. Ah, I, I can see like 
five, off. six games up on the shelf there. Yep. Oh, and there goes an N64 car. So ah, it belongs that on the, the floor. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I just acquired my first Switch just after Christmas. It was like Christmas money, and it was like, okay, what do we, what do we spend it on? Let's get the Switch. So we got the Switch. And so it's going to change. I'm going to be playing more indie games because I also just got my first Xbox as well. And I got uh-huh. an Xbox One S and Game Pass, and I hate to advertise Game Pass as a Sony pony, but it's a fabulous service with plenty of indie games on it as well that are easy to dive into. So I haven't had an Xbox yes. since uh, the first Xbox. I got that, and I got a 360 at a car boot sale. It lasted one week. Fucking thing. But yeah, that's me and Xbox, that my history in a nutshell. So stories untold. Not many indie yeah. games, you admit, but that doesn't mean this is a crap game. So what I see is it's a horror episode game, is what it's saying. What the fuck it's is an that ep- then? Yeah, it's, a, it's an episodic psychological journey of a game is what this game is. So it's not a jump scare uh, horror. It's not that typical crap. No, no, it's Good. not a jump scare horror at all. It's it's all psychological and it's all beautifully done and it's all done in a a retro style. So ah. there's four episodes. And the first episode, again, this is a story-driven game because that's what I play. I play story-driven games. Hmm. And the first episode you play... Now, I don't know if you'll remember Text Adventures. Yeah, I remember Zork. Oh, yep, yeah, text adventures <laughs> on the, especially on like the ZX Spectrum, the home microcomputer era, where you also had maybe a, a basic drawing, a picture of the scene, as well as the text. And Lord of the Rings and Never Ending Story all had, you know, yeah. a picture, then the text would be, you are standing in a forest. It plays like that, but you're playing the game from a first person point of view playing that game so you're playing a character playing a text adventure in the first episode yeah it it looks like just from most of the screenshots i'm seeing it's an old school crt next to what could be called some sort of zx spectrum type computer you know it's just a keyboard with not much else there that's all i'm seeing that and what is blatantly a 70s house behind it with a really crap lamp, really shit wallpaper. <laughs> yep. And you can't that's... really set the scene any more than that. It looks like you're playing a game within a game. You're you're playing a game within a game, yes. And this was free, I believe, like PlayStation Plus or something like that. The first episode was free. And the first episode is just purely this text adventure that you're playing through another character. And I don't know whether it's just so well done or maybe my experience playing a lot of those games back in the day, I often felt like I could see, I could picture the scene that the text was describing. And it's really hard to explain but after playing that first episode, I felt like I had played the game in third person. It was really, it was a really weird experience. And it's very, very psychological. The game, you start playing the game and it's quite basic. It's I it won't ruin much this the story because it's right at the beginning. The first part of the game that you're playing as someone else is it says it says up on the screen, you drive into the driveway. You stop the car and then it's up to you to open the door or do whatever. And you go through the motions, open the door, look, you see a house, go up to the house, you know, open the door, the door is locked and all that stuff is going on. But slowly as the game progresses, things start to glitch. Now there are, I suppose, tiny jump scare elements in it, Hmm. but it's purely done through the atmosphere of the game as small things start to glitch within the game that you're playing as it's really hard to describe because (laughs) you look like you're trying not to give away the story but yeah it's tough it it messes with your head in a good way in a game way and by the end of playing that first episode i felt like 
I had played that as a third person character, like an Uncharted game or whatever. I had, I so felt you did like get I'd, sucked in and your imagination I did felt, take over. I felt that I'd got out of that car, I had opened that door, I had went round the back of the house and all the stuff that it asked you to do. But as it goes on, it becomes darker and darker. When you drive up to the house for the first time, it's a pleasant house. It's well lit, you know, there's a light on the porch. When you, then it reboots and you have to do it again. Hmm. The windows are broken. There's a chill wind, you know. Ah, right. <laughs> you have so, to play the game again. With the, and that's uh, only the first episode. I'm, I'm going to have to check this game out. I've just uh, looked online. It's apparently at this point in time, £8.99 Switch Digital. So I think I'm going to get that. That's a good price to just delve in. Another thing to spend money on. Woo. At least this one I can afford. Ish. Um, so you see the uh, setting as just a CRT TV to one side. You've got your computer there to the other. And the text, of course, appears on the screen of the CRT. Does that ever change? Does the environment change or is it only the text? No, the environment changes around you subtly. You won't even notice it until uh, you notice it. So when you look at the reception, you, you go, wait, what the fuck? Yeah, things will change right in front of your eyes that you won't notice until something in the programming directs you to notice that it's been changed. It's really clever. It's well done. I'm As I said, this. I felt like I played the game in third person. It was weird. It was... I am liking this. I can't remember the first uh, text game I ever played. I forget what the fucking name of the thing was, but I played it in school. Friend told me about it. Went home and he says, if you type in this gubbins, this bollocks, this shit, then you'll be back on the game and you'll be back exactly where you left it with the same sort of statuses and all the choices you made. It's like, oh, brilliant. But of course, back then, that was a real pain in the ass to do. But when I did it, I played it for like two hours that night. And then I remember when you get up, you go to walk away and you hear a thud somewhere. It's like, fuck off. Whatever that was, fuck off. It's your imagination. Just going mad. You've been playing yeah. a really good horror game. And all it is is fucking writing. It's just like reading yeah, a scary a, book. A, yeah. And the, 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 for me, it done such a wonderful job. It really did suck me in. That, and that was just the first episode. So that is it was, difficult, uh, let's see, in terms of gameplay, like go north, go north, no. go north, you're dead, fuck you. No, it's not difficult because it's, it's more like the... Maniac Mansion style, where you had options. You were, you don't have to type in. We're playing on a console with a controller. So at the bottom of the screen, it will give you the options that you have got. So I, I prefer that because that was the hard thing about Zork. So long, you'd be like, you're at a White House. What do you want to do? I don't know. How do I, how do I progress the fucking story? You don't know all the things. Yeah, you, you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the amount of times. So, yeah, you've got the options there at the bottom of the screen within the screen. So it's like. What is it? Pick with D-pad and select with A, that yeah. sort of horse shit. Yeah, right. it's just like, it's just, yeah, go down with your cursor and, okay, look, and then it'll give you a new option, look what, you know. So you don't Excellent. need to remember. It doesn't tell you, <laughs> I don't know what open means, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you get annoyed in them games, you go, why don't you fuck yourself? Don't know how to I... fuck something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, yeah. I've got to try this out now. It does seem quite imaginative. So um, I was going to say, and I still will, fuck it. So it's mostly text. It's mostly text on a screen. There is some visual change within the environment. Do you think a game like this would put off a young gamer, like your son maybe, or someone like that? Do you think they would take one look at this and go, ah, oh, fuck that, I can go and play, uh, I don't know, The Last of Us or some shit? It would depend on the kid. Uh, I've got four. My God, yes, four. Uh, my son <laughs> just so everyone knows he was holding his head then was like thinking right one two three <laughs> counting my son wouldn't play it because he's not that interested in anything except what he's playing at the time obviously it started with minecraft and fortnite and rocket league and stuff like that. Oh, whatever fuck he's playing fortnite. i'll play minecraft yeah. and rocket league any day fortnite no whatever he's playing that's what he's playing whereas uh one of the young daughters, however, will play anything, and she would sit down and play it. Awesome. Yeah. But it just depends on the player, I think. I mean, I had that young daughter of mine playing Hungry Horus, which is a game, a Pac-Man clone for the ZX Spectrum, released in 1982. Oh. And I'm... 
as a modern gamer, because she's got access to everything, she sat and played that simple Pac-Man clone for about two hours. I know what you mean. My little one, uh, five-year-old daughter, her one of her favourite games, Adventure on the Atari 2600. She'll put it on and she'll just go through all the motions, do it all, complete it, go over, hit reset and do it again. You always say, don't you want to try one of the other levels? Why would I want to do that? I know how to do this one. No, I don't all, all right, fair enough. At the end of the day, you're playing it, you're enjoying it. Fuck the other levels. They don't matter half as much as the fact you're doing it. Yeah. But, the but kids... no, it would depend on the player. It, it would yeah. be a great way to introduce a new player to text adventure because it's not as clumsy and clunky as the original text adventures where you, you had to know the syntax. You had to know which words were in that data bank. Yeah, if you, you didn't get you a manual with use. the game, you didn't stand a chance. No. Even if you did have a manual with the game, you didn't stand a chance with half of those text adventures. No, I don't think I've ever beaten one, if I'm honest. I, no, I always I, get to I a point where it's so. like, I don't know what to do. Do, yeah. yeah. And when you start going online for walkthroughs on text adventure games, that's when you've really hit the pointless part of playing anything. <laughs> I, I'm yeah. all I'm all for walkthroughs, just so everyone knows. I don't consider walkthroughs cheating. If you're so stuck you're not having fun, for fuck's sake, Google what to do next. I get that. That's fine. But if you're doing it on a text adventure, that is pointless. Yeah. You might as well watch a Let's Play of it. To me, it means the game's broken. Well, yeah. It means the game's broken. It's To be fair, they were trying to do a lot. They were trying to make Dungeons & Dragons digital, and that's quite a task. Yeah, yeah. Back then, they could do it now with the processing power that our consoles and PCs have. But not back in the eighties, trying to do that, a, a big world. Oh, we didn't succeed, ish, until like Ultima and Wizardry. But before that, yeah, we had all these yeah. text games, and as you say, it was a bastard. No one knew how to yeah. make it happen. Yeah. But yeah, thank God yeah. That we're all right now. So yeah, that was the first episode and that was free. And after I played that, I had to buy the full release. You felt compelled to, eh? I felt I had to know where the story was going. Why was it in four episodes? Was it going to be more of this text adventure or where's this leading me? Because I'm a sucker for narrative. Well, I got a bit here on uh, Wikipedia of the game. I don't think it has any spoilers, so I think I can say this. The story takes place in England, 1986. The first three episodes are ostensibly standalone games. In the first episode, the player has no name or even specified gender. In the second, he's referred to as Mr. Fuck, I can't even read that. Al- A- Atian? A- stupid fucking name. And in the third, James. It is revealed in the concluding fourth that the games are actually all connected. Other than that, you know, everything else is spoilers, so I'm not really saying anything. All that is is a description as what the fuck's going on. The artwork for the game is awesome. It looks like something from Stranger Things. Exactly. And it's got that vibe to it as well. Is that what Throughout. pulled you in? You saw that and thought, ooh, Stranger Things. No, it was free. It was free. It was just and a it was free. It. <laughs> it was free. I downloaded it. I had nothing to do. It was during a lockdown, and I said, okay, uh, I'll give it a go, and... Oh. I'm jealous. I wasn't affected by the lockdown. I still had to go to work. I still had to do stuff because I'm essential, apparently. <laughs> you got to stay home and be happy, you bastard. Yeah, I got to stay home and be happy. And dye your hair blue. <laughs> and, make, and make a YouTube video <laughs> or a channel so, even. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't all good then. No. <laughs> At some point you made something you regret. Yeah, the first video. <laughs> Hold up. No one's ever happy with the first video. My one was just meant to be a joke. Friend said, why don't you put it on YouTube? All right. And I was only doing it because I had another friend who was stuck at home, massively injured from a car crash. He wanted to do YouTube to get money, and he kept making these videos, and he kept asking everyone for advice. We're like, yeah, sure, give you advice. Say what you think. And then he completely blanked it. You're like, why am I giving this cunt advice? One day I'm at the car boot, getting well, looking for games, and I found a stack, like a mountain of Xbox 360s. I thought, that is shit. That is stupidly shit. I don't know why. A little video of it. Not even a picture. I did video. Then more video. I thinking, I can make a funny, jokey vid, like two minutes long. And then show him and say, this is what you should do. He didn't agree, but another friend said, put it out there. And now, thanks to that cunt, I'm where I am today. Like, thanks, <laughs> Pete, you bastard. There's my backstory. Well, I think I think we're all better off for it. Well, no, 
I've I made don't the world yourself, but... no. I've made the world more known about Flintstones and Master System, so that's not a good. Oh, there's a game. Have you ever played and it? On the, on the ZX Spectrum, I played it. Oh, it's Christ. the same game. The one, yeah, you have to paint the walls and drive the car and paint the people, walls. And people yeah. want me to talk about that on air one day. Oh no! I know I can't get away from it. It's my Doctor yeah. Jekyll and Mister Hyde. That's how I describe it. It's, it's awful. It's in, on an 8-bit microcomputer, the ZX Spectrum, where you've got colour clash because it doesn't even have the layers for the graphics and colour. And You just imagine the Master System version, but with shitty graphics. Yeah, the Master System, the only thing it's got going for it is the graphics. That is it. Yeah. Music sucks, gameplay sucks, everything yeah. else sucks, but at least it looks pretty. Yeah, take away the graphics, and that's what you've got with the ZX Spectrum. Oh, <laughs> It was funny though, what? on a little uh, tangent about this retro wolf 88, who's recently um, been on the podcast, obviously, as we're doing this one, that one hasn't come out yet. So Stuart wouldn't have seen it, but Tom and Lacey sent me a Marco Polo little video of him. Cause he was around their house and he was playing the game. He had no idea that he had been tricked and he was playing a horrible game. He sent one video of him going, okay, you know, I'll, Give it a try. I'll see what the game's like. Next video. How do you move the fucking ladder? I can't move the <laughs> fucking ladder. It's bullshit. You're not meant to... Oh, no, wait. I figured it out. Oh, no, wait. I haven't. Why can't I move the fucking ladder? <laughs> and then it just goes, yeah. died. Level one. Paint the wall. He's got no. Fuck the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did catch that video. It was quite amusing. Yeah. It's nice to see other people sharing that pain. I mean... Oh, God, there's some pain. <laughs> Fuck that thing. Yes. So, anyway, we've... uh. We've covered your games today. We've got your modern game. We've got your retro game. We've had your indie game. We've got to talk about you, your channel, and your ongoing future as the host for YouTuber of the Month slash year. So yeah. all I can say about that is good luck. I hope it all goes much better than it did last year for Sega Zombie. Poor bastard. Yeah, I hope so. But as I say, it's the people who are nominated. They're the ones who put into uh, what comes out of it. So it's up to them. I'm merely post the videos and chase them up to do their videos. But <laughs> Yes, God. I, actually, I remember when Tom and Lacey chased me up, they said, you've won. Oh, have I? Okay, what do I do then? And they said, we're thinking of doing an Easter theme thing. Right. Right. Uh, I had no fucking idea. I said, okay, can you get hold of a golden egg? Tom's like, yes. Right, get hold of one of them. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And then the next day I've got a script. I've thrown it his way. I thought I was meant to come up with everything. <laughs> so I just says, can you get one prop? Because I've got a joke in my mind, but you have to have a thing. So they got a golden egg. Their one was this big. So it's, uh, basically could fit in your hand, people. The one I had, you could fit in both hands. So the size was wrong. Fuck it. It's YouTube. It doesn't matter. Stupid ass jokey video. Tom and Lacey says my one was the easiest one because they didn't have to do much. They You've didn't have the to book. think yeah. of anything, and I fucked up and thought I had to do the lot. So, <laughs> first time I met them, I thought, bastards, you've won a thing, now make effort. Oh, <laughs> I hope you don't you know, put that's anyone what through is. that. <laughs> but that's what YouTuber of the month is. You don't win, you just get a chance to meet the rest of the community, but you've got to put the work into it. It's as simple as that. God, have I met some people through that. Jesus. I, I can't yeah. even think how many. It's a lot of people. Yeah, it's a lot. But anyway, fuck it. Yep. For everyone out there, please check out Generation Pixel. There will be details in this uh, video. If you're watching it on YouTube, in the podcast description, you'll find links to channel, links straight to the latest thing at the time for YouTube of the month. So you can hopefully get a vote in on that, whatever one we're at at the time. Other than that, I can't think of what else to say, except please subscribe to both Generation Pixel and the Sega Head channel, which you know you've, you've done already, yeah? done that haven't you no oh anyway thank you very much for listening to this today have you got anything else you would like to add Stu? no just thank you for having me on tom it's been an absolute pleasure and it's going to be weird not getting to listen to this one when it goes out because i'm not going to listen to myself again <laughs> <laughs> i and, had and to <laughs> this is this is my wednesday morning before work ritual now listening to six 16 bitching so, oh, so you've got to miss one. I fucked it for you. Whoops. I've got to miss one. <laughs> <laughs>
Never mind. You can make um, your kids listen to it. That's an idea. Oh, that'll never work. <laughs> make it as a punishment then you either do your chores or you can listen to me ramble for an hour with a complete twat that can't structure anything oh they'd be fine listening to you it's listening to me that they have this deaf spot for anyway so <laughs> yay family <laughs> yay. Right. well thank you very much everyone for listening and we shall talk to you next time